Hi, welcome to the International Space Station Flight Control Room. I have an exciting person here to visit visit us today, guest um, at NASA astronaut Katie Coleman. Katie, thank you so much for coming today. I'm happy to be here. So we're having all kinds of great stuff happening on, aboard the International Space Station. I'm so glad that you came here. First, Katie, um, is she was the Expedition 2627 flight engineer aboard the International Space Station. She is a veteran of three space flights, so two of which were aboard the space shuttle STS-73 and STS-93. And uh, But mo most recently, she was living aboard the International Space Station, where she stayed for 159 days. That's a long time. <laughs> so um, we are so very, very glad to have you here. And uh, we just want to get into talking about all this stuff. Actually, another little tidbit. Katie, actually, in a year, or it will have been a year, in exactly one week from today, when she actually returned to Earth. Um, I cannot believe it's been a year since you've been back. It goes so fast once you get back. It's amazing to me as well, and it's really just neat to see docking and to remember back to, you know, just a year and a half ago arriving at the station. Wow, and it's so exciting to see, um, just to be able to see the crew members who are aboard the station and being able to see those visitors come on board. And now I know you actually docked and, and joined a crew that was there, but at the time that you were there, you also received visitors on two shuttle vis you know, visits that came up there. So tell me first what is that like to, to dock and join the crew, but also to receive visitors? What is that like as a crew member aboard the space station? Well, I, I tell people that we go up in groups of three, but we make a crew of six. And it's interesting, you'd think we'd spend a lot of t time together, the six of us, but really the three of us that go up in the Soyuz spend a lot of time together. And we do, you know, the emergency practicing and all that kind of stuff with the other folks that we're going to join on board. But in some cases, especially with the Russian crew members, we don't know them really quite as well. And so the minute you get on board, you're, you're kind of saying hello to some people you don't really know incredibly well. But what is amazing is that you're all there for the same purpose. And these guys that we joined, we, we, we joined uh, Sasha Kaleri, Alex Skripochka, and Scott Kelly. And they were just so happy to have us on board, I think because they loved being on board. Mm -hmm. And they loved the, the work that they were doing. And they just couldn't wait to you know drag three more people into it and, and have us all just producing a lot of good science for the station. Help and work together and see some new faces, I'm sure, as well, is, is probably nice to, to, to have on board this space station after so long. And I guess, you know, while you didn't know each other as, as well and throughout the training process and beforehand, but once you get there, I'm sure you get to know each other a little better, you know, living there aboard the space station together. You know, it's really true, and I think being on the station at all is such an amazing experience. And in fact, after, you know, 159 days, you know, I, I really would have stayed another six months in a minute. I mean, I did want to come home eventually, but it never gets old there. It's never boring. You're always busy, and it's an amazing place. And I'm always driven to share that, and I think all of us are. And when a new crew comes aboard, it's this great opportunity to say, look at this, and look at this, and can you believe we get to do this? I mean, it's just, um, it's really it's really pretty neat. I, I remember the night that we actually docked. I mean, we have a lot of simulators here at NASA, and they all simulate the space station in certain ways, but not exactly visually, you know, and I was focusing as we docked on the on the camera, on the, the screens that give all the data about how the docking is going. And in the simulator, I never think to look out the window, because what am I going to see? You know, some fake space station out there. So when I looked over and saw the actual space station, and it's just so clear and crisp, because there's no atmosphere in between your window and, and the space station, I was so excited. And we just could barely wait through all the leak checks to get the hatches open and then come inside. Well, that makes me think of something, too. So you're talking about the end of that two-day journey, but there is a two-day journey from the time that you launched, just as it was for Padaka, Revan, and Akaba. They launched Monday night, late last night, uh, Monday night, and then docked to the station late last night. So tell me a little about that journey. What is that like? Because it's literally two days. What are you doing? You're, you're in very close quarters aboard the Soyuz, and you're just orbiting until you get to the space station. So I can imagine getting there is pretty exciting for you guys, but what are you doing during that two-day journey? Well, there's always more room than you would think. As soon as you hit zero gravity, which is eight and a half minutes after launch, mm -hmm. then everything, including you, is floating around if you're not strapped in, which we, we do start off that way. And we have a little compartment that has, you know, basically a lot of cargo strapped to it, but it's, you know, it's about as sort of big as this little area right around, you know, a sort of in a, a VW bug-sized area right around us. So there is some room there. 
so I don't really feel crowded. And it's more, you know, we, we waited so long to, to go to space. Mm -hmm. And then there we are in this tiny little capsule, just the three of us, Dimitri, Paula Nespoli, and I. And it's really an incredible view. I mean, it's, it's spinning a little bit, so it's sort of rotating. And you're looking at the Earth, and the Earth is coming into view and going out, and coming into view and going out. And I found it to be actually amazingly intimate, really. I mean, a, in a space shuttle, it's just such a big vehicle. There's a lot between you and space, whereas in the Soyuz, when it's just the three of you, I, I really found this very special experience just to be able to kind of, as a human, look out and realized that I was in a very special place and yeah. I had some time to relax before it was time to get to work on the station. Yeah, well, that's uh, very interesting uh, because I would just think I would go out of my mind <laughs> being that, that close, but it's nice to know that at least you have that a little bit of space so it's not quite as cramped. It's not what we see, you know, at the on the launch video when we see on the inside everyone in their, the right seat, the center seat, and the left seat. You know, you're not like that the entire time, so it's good to know that you have a little bit of mobility. You know, we definitely do, and, and we have actually all the amenities as well. You know, we have a bathroom, you know, works fine, and there's enough room that two people could go downstairs into the Soyuz horse ball, you know, if you need some privacy. Um, we have food, we've got a window, and um, and we've got just, uh, we've got, I don't know, some we had some cameras to be able to take some pictures, and even just a little bit of sort of studying what is our cargo, where is it, how are we going to unpack it, mm -hmm. um, and, a, and a little sleeping too. I think that time before launch is pretty long. Yeah. and just tiring, and so we, I, we caught up on our sleep. Um, everybody on our crew felt actually just great, so uh, we just had a nice time in those two days. Sure, I can imagine that with the adrenaline rush of launch and that sort of thing, after a while you just kind of uh, settle down and get ready for sleep, so um, I can see that. Now, we, once you do dock, and you were talking about, I can't. we just can't wait to get the hatches opening, can you just explain, once you dock, so for example, last night, um, the Soyuz 04M docked to the space station at 11.36 p.m. Central Time, last night, but the hatches won't open until 3.10 in the morning. Can you explain what is what takes that time to, uh, before you, I mean, it's not like, honey, I'm home, and open up the doors. So explain why, you know, the, I know, I understand there's some leak and pressure checks, so what is going on um, before the hatches are open? Well, the way our spacecraft connects to the station, it's kind of like having a front hall of a house. You know, and so let's say Scott and Sasha and, uh, and Oleg are inside the house, not in the front hall, they're inside the house. And then we basically come to the front door of the house and attach there. But before we, um, before we want to open our hatch, we want to make sure we have a really good seal. So we're actually going to check our seal between the Soyuz and the front door of the house. And then we're going to check this, we're actually going to check the pressure inside the front hall. So everything has to be checked to make sure that when we do open that hatch, that we have a really good seal between us and the inside of the station. I mean, we don't want the station to lose any air, and we can actually, you know, back away and then come back in if we needed to, if for some reason we didn't have a good seal. But the way that Soyuz is designed, if you dock, I mean, there's sort of a probe that sort of draws you in, and then there's hooks that pull you in. Um, you're going to have a good seal, but we just make sure we check the pressure. We have pressure sensors out there, you know, in the front hall, pressure sensors inside our Soyuz, and we actually, you know, just see that the pressure holds before we open the doors. And that, you want to be really sure, so it just takes a couple hours to do. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you for explaining that, because I don't think a lot of people understood why, you know, why can't you just get there and open the door and be there? And I can imagine just the anticipation, but certainly we can understand the uh, the reasons behind that. You know, there are some safety issues and that sort of thing. So speaking of safety, um, one of the first orders of business after you get aboard and you're excited and you see each other and there's a welcome <coughs> ceremony, um, you're also able to conference with family on the ground who had been actually traveled to Russia to see you guys off. What is What is that like? You know, it's so marvelous to see your family and to be able to actually, you know, know that they can see you. And my, my husband and my son, who's 11, and my son, who's 28, had all traveled to the launch. And it was just neat to, to be able to wave to them and say hello and, and you know, and feel a little bit close. I mean, here I got to, I finally got there. And it's hard, hard to believe that a human being really does get to leave the planet and then go live on a space station and getting to just say hi to your family. And, you know, it just was neat. I, 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 some of my favorite pictures are actually pictures that they sent me of my family in mission control talking to me. And, you know, for example, Dima's son said, you know, Papa, will you bring a toy home for me? You know, so to them, it's just nice to connect as well. And I got to say hello to some friends and, you know, it's, it's kind of that time of being a little connected to the Earth before you're really just 
you know, isolated up in space. Sure, and I, and I know that you are able to stay connected throughout your mission as well, but it is, I can imagine, nice, especially after, you know, your family, again, it, when you when you mentioned they were talking to you in mission control, it's mission control in Moscow, so um, at that center, and so they stay a, a few days afterward and wait for your journey to, um, for you to arrive at this space station. So um, it's, it's an amazing adventure, I'm sure, for both sides, uh, you as well as the family as well. Now, um, also, one of the first order of business um, after the family conference, the welcome ceremony, is first and foremost the safety briefing. Can you walk through what exactly does that entail? This is similar to getting on an airplane. And the flight attendants always explain, you know, where are the exits and how are you going to know how to find the exits and where your flotation device is. Well, we actually learn all that stuff before we leave home. And so we know that. But it's somehow different to see it in the real space station in a floating around kind of environment. And I, I say floating, but really it's about flying around. And for example, when we do simulations, which we do really a lot of emergency simulations, there are in the ceiling, so to speak, of the Japanese module, that's where some of the, that's where one of the fire extinguishers is. Well, in a practical sense, here on the ground, I'm not tall enough to reach up and get that, and that fire extinguisher is going to be heavy. So in a simulation, it's just going to be, you know, on the floor or next to you know, where, where the real place is. And when I say I'm going to go get that fire extinguisher, what I do is I go up and I tap that panel, and then I get it from the real place. But it's still not the same as really seeing where everything is. And it's literally a tour of the, of the fire extinguishers, of the extra oxygen masks, um, of where the computers really are. Even though we, we actually know it intellectually, it's important to really experience that. And that's why, you know, we don't just say we're going to have a fire drill in an elementary school, we actually have fire drills so the kids can really practice, you can really do it. And we do those kinds of exercises on board as well while we're up there to make those kinds of things real to us in case we need to do them. Sure. Now, um, also, so today, the uh, Padaka, Revan, and Akaba are going through some familiarization tasks. So can you explain exactly, is, I mean, the adjusting to gravity, what, what is exactly are they doing to familiarize themselves? Well, my first, you know, recollection is actually Scott Kelly was our, you know, guy who was already on board, and then together we became the three USOS, United States Operating System, or se segment uh, crew members. And Scott was just so excited to show us everything. He'd go, okay, so when you're going to do water sampling, okay, it's going to have, you know, three pages of directions. But really the important things to notice are, is this thing plugged in? And make, make sure you see this before you turn it on. And, you know, and, but if for, of course, I mean, we're going to start with the real players. We're going to start with the bathroom. <laughs> and so we had a bathroom tour. I mean, it all works pretty well. But again, you know, we've trained here on the ground, and this bathroom is an engineering system, right? But it just helps to have somebody show you in real life, this is how it works. This is the noises it makes sometimes. Don't worry about that noise. Do worry about this noise. You know, we're, we're up there together, and these systems are really important. So, you know, we're pretty candid about these things. And, you know, Scott would say, listen, if you ever see, you know, this or this, you know, I don't care if I'm asleep. You wake me up, and we'll solve that problem together. We'll talk to the ground. But don't be shy about it. So, you know, we're establishing those kinds of relationships in real life, and also just a tour. You know, sure. we're seeing the exercise equipment. We're seeing the cupola. We're making sure we understand how to open and shut the windows, how they really feel, what's all the way closed, what's all the way open. A lot of very practical kinds of well, things. Well, and I can imagine even, you know, the tour is kind of beneficial, especially for someone like you, because you weren't there. You had been there before, and it looked very, very different when you came back, when you returned. And so there were some new things aboard the space station. Um, you want to talk about what, what was new when you got there? Well, for me, it was actually all new in that my particular missions that I had been on, I had never been to the station. Oh, right. you were I had a laboratory that. mission, which was literally a mock-up of doing experiments, and right. it was our, our proving ground for a lot of experiments and how to do experiments right. up there. And then we launched the Chandra. So I had never been to the, to the station before. Right. So it was all kind of new. So to me, you know, just seeing it big and wonderful, and I tell kids it's like, you know, eight school buses all strung together in a line or, you know, one big train, long train of about eight train cars. So it's, it's actually pretty big. But um, so it's, you didn't, I never felt closed in there, and it was also just nice to have my own little place there. I had my own cabin, and uh, Scott was just really nice. I mean, it, 
it was kind of like going to visit somebody and they haven't had company in a little while and he's just all excited about having guests and you know he made sure that our beds were ready and that every you know all our stuff was lined up so we could find it it was just really really nice of him and, and pretty cute so well let's talk about this you were talking about your your you know having your beds ready in your little area so I know also today a Cabo was setting up his crew quarters I'm going to talk about the crew quarters because you do have a private space <clears throat> describe for us if you will just a little bit about the size of that space what is in that space what what can, what do you do in that space? Um, different folks are different. I think it depends how big they are. Mm -hmm. um, I can do everything and anything in my quarters, and even actually turn upside down if I'm curled up into a little ball. And there's times I would actually li I like to sleep that way. So we have a sleeping bag that's kind of hanging on the wall. It's actually kind of tacked down in a couple places. And sometimes it's nice not to have it tacked down. And I would you know wake up and look and see sort of a view and realize, oh, that's the bottom of the computer. I must be upside down. So in there, it's, it's really our space. We, in general, have our own computer in there so we can do email. Um, we can actually have an internet protocol phone. I could call my family every day, which I did, I think, except for about three days. And, and with the door shut, it's very soundproof. And for me as a person, that was important. You know, in that you can have a conversation with somebody on the ground, can do a little venting, which I think is pretty healthy, and uh, and you know just you know have a conversation that is private and personal, as as private and personal as any cell phone call, even down here on the earth. Sure. And is. I can imagine that personal private space is very important to have, you know, while you're at it, just as it is for anyone here on Earth. We all need our our space, so it's very nice to know that you guys have that area, you know, aboard the space station. So you also, I understand, are able to set up a, a laptop computer and, and that sort of thing as well, you know, in that crew quarters, so you can... Right, and, and probably when Joe arrives, uh, arrived today, mm -hmm. you know, probably his computer is actually already all set there and it already knows that it's going to be Joe's computer. There'll be a whole series of ways to attach stuff to the walls of the crew quarters, because that's the secret to being up there, is that everything is going to float around. And so we will maybe make like sort of a little lattice work of bungee cords that you can tuck things under, which is a little dangerous because when you pull something out, you know, the rest of the bungee cord <laughs> moves and something else will float out. Mm -hmm. um, but then we also have Velcro, little Velcro patches, you know, on the sides of the walls so we can attach little, I would have like a little bag that would have, you know, maybe my toiletries in there, um, you know, just little or you know, notebooks, my notebook could stick to the wall. Try to put everything in the same place all the time so that you can always find it. And so Joe is making that place, you know, just good for his stuff and deciding, well, what things does he want to keep out towards the bathroom compartment and what things does he want to keep there in his cabin. I usually would keep, you know, a few, like a change of clothes in my cabin, my gym clothes, things like that. But then, you know, the majority of my clothes, which are not too many, would be out in another place in the station. Just And then when I needed a new shirt, I'd go find one. But I didn't want to keep a lot of stuff in my cabin or else it's just a mess. Sure. And so you mentioned not too many. So how often did you get to change your clothes? Or how how long did you wear, say, let's just say a shirt. How long would you wear a shirt? It depends. I mean, I, I like to wear different stuff, different days. So we had, I think, uh, 12 shirts for six months. And so I would actually get a few of them out and wear a couple of them. And so basically I'd have sort of like, you know, three shirts that were, you could think of them as either clean or dirty and wear those until you basically spilled something on them, which isn't going to happen like this way. It's going to happen when something just from somebody, even yourself, just sort of squirts towards you and suddenly <laughs> your shirt's got spots on it and it's just not as nice. Um, so we, we usually have about a one pair of pants a month. It sounds terrible, like it's n not very much and that we would all be smelly, but we weren't. I mean, it just somehow don't get as dirty up there, although we do a lot of exercise and we have separate gym clothes and we do change those, you know, all the time. In fact, I was the exercise clothes police. I would go, boys, it's, it's new gym clothes day. <laughs> it's time. <laughs> That's great. Well, um, so let's just real quick, I, you know, I you asked, and so and I promised I would ask a question, so we're going to go, and we had polled Twitter for a few questions, and so I'm going to go ahead and ask one of those questions for them. Um, First, the first question comes from Tyler Russell. What's your favorite space meal? I like just kind of comfort food. I like things like beef stew and macaroni and cheese and, you know, broccoli <laughs> and stuff like that. Now, I understand there is a favorite dessert. You want to talk about that one? I, I hear it from many of the astronauts, the cherry blueberry cobbler. Ah, 
you know, I did actually like those cobblers um, quite a bit. Although, some a lot of our stuff has sort of a preservative kind of taste in it, so it will last forever and ever and not be bad. And after a little while, I have to say that I got a little tired of that taste. <laughs> I can imagine. So uh, let's go with the second question. This one comes from Harper Gardner. What is the best or the worst part of your week aboard the ISS? Well, the best is every single morning. You know, waking up. Um, our crew was kind of a late night crew, so we'd stay up late and then stay up late and then get up get up, you know, right before the day started. So I would, you know, set my alarm just a few minutes before our first daily conference. And I would have already read all the messages and things like that the, the night before, so I'd be ready. So I would just, like, wake up, fly down the lab, you know, go brush my teeth and, teeth and everything. And, you know, my commute was five minutes and really only 30 seconds. So I just loved waking up every morning just going, I am going to work, <laughs> and I am flying through the lab. So I really liked uh, that part. The worst part is, is just that there's so much good work to do, and it takes a frustratingly long time to do that work, especially because everything is flying around, and, and you can lose things. You have to be so careful not to lose things. And not losing things is stressful. I find it stressful down here on the Earth, uh, and especially so up there. And just you know, there's so much good science work to do that if you could just do it faster, we'd be discovering more things. And so I just felt a, a pressure to be working a lot. Sure. So... We, talk, we talked about work, and you guys do have that red line that goes across the timeline, and you're constantly scheduled for every little thing. But let's talk about playtime or your spare time. And now I know one of the things that you are famous for, uh -oh. you are famous for this, was your flute playing there in the space. And uh, you actually, and I'll, I'll go ahead and pick this up, you actually brought one of your flutes with you. So um, talk to us a little about, you know, I understand, I think you would spend time in the cupola and, and just explain where that is and... and what you would do, you know, during your spare time? Well, this is uh, my actual flute that went to space, um, at least uh, most of it. The top part is actually, I took um, the top part, a mouthpiece that is sort of generic for any flute, and I took one that belonged to the flute company, and they have it in a flute mobile where basically beginning flute students around the country get to put that mouthpiece of that flute, which has been, I think, I don't know, 50, 60 million miles, um, in their flute, and they get to play part of the flute that went to space. But the rest of it uh, is mine. And I played in the cupola, which is right in the middle of the, of the space station, for a couple reasons. First of all, the windows, the view, getting to look out at the same time that I'm playing music. And I generally don't really play alone down here on the Earth. I play with people. So I brought music of some of my favorite folks to play with down here, which actually include other astronauts that um, just uh, Dan Burbank just landed. Chris Hadfield is about to be up on the station next December. Um, Mickey Pettit is our singer, and her husband Don is up on the space station right now. And and Steve Robinson was on the mission that actually installed the cupola. So when I'm up there playing, and I'm listening to our our band rehearse and playing along, you know, they're up there with me. It was also a place that was good to play because it was in the middle of the station, and everybody sleeps at either end of the station. So I knew I wouldn't wake anybody up. That's great. It must be nice. So tell me real quick just a few things. I mean, aside from flute playing, what other things did you do? I, I actually saw a question on Twitter. I didn't I didn't bring that one here. I'll just I'll just throw it out there. But the question was, uh, uh, can you play tag on ISS? So I guess what they're asking the question is, is really about your free time and how you interact with the others, you know, as well. So explain some of that stuff. I mean, maybe, you know, watching television or, you know, dinner time or anything like that. You know, different crews are going to be different, and I'm convinced that we will have new microgravity games, you know, that are just could, are invented because we're up there. You know, we would do things like it, it's not about floating around, it's about flying, and so we'd have little contests to see who could go the furthest through the station without running into anything. In other words, have really good aim to be able to launch yourself, and, and that was um, pretty fun. You know, sitting around, we would actually do that, even though we sort of float around together, but it would get to be Friday evening, and, and you're really tired and kind of done thinking, and you've really been working really hard all week. And in general, we would kind of sit around and watch a movie together. It was something that our crew liked to, to do together. And then on Saturdays, we'd each kind of do our own thing, work our exercise in when we wanted to. A lot of corresponding with friends and family and trying to find ways to, to share. And I, I'd say you can never, you know, do that quite enough. But I, I, it's never ever boring up there. No, I, you know, and honestly, I, f I followed your mission, and uh, 
you know, you did a lot of things of those extra things and trying to share that story because, and I think that even with the stuff that you did um, and, and sent down to us and let us know, you know, this is what you guys are doing up there. And like you said, it's never, it never gets boring. There's just never, an, I mean, there's never too much that you can share with us because there are so many things. And even from my point of view, being here, um, there's always something that I learn every day about what it's like on the space station and, you know, what not working and living and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, I'm always surprised because I'm thinking, wow, there's, you know, I just, it just, it doesn't get old, even from my standpoint. So I can't imagine being up there that it would get old for you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask another Twitter question. So this third Twitter question comes from Dark Gengar. What one thing do you miss from Earth while living in space? I missed family. You know, it, we I got to talk to them every day, and every week we would have a video conference, and, and we would even just do things my son and I like read. You know, I would read. I had some books electronically, um, which was really, really nice up there, and I would I would actually read to him, um, not every day, but many days. And in some ways, it kind of gave us this sort of little emotional space to be together. Because, you know, I don't know, you can only talk to your mom every day for so many days. Like, hi, how was your day? Oh, my day was fine. You know, even though I'm doing cool things and he's doing cool things, it's just not what an 11-year-old wants to do. And so by just reading together, we just kind of give ourselves a way to sort of be together. So I would do some of that. Oh, that sounds great. Um, so let's go ahead and ask the last uh, question from Twitter, and then we're going to be close to wrap-up time here on the today's ISS update hour. This question comes from Tara. Was it difficult to adjust to micro-G and back to 1G? Which was harder? Well, it's funny you should ask, because I, I have this image now that um, Joe and Gennady and Sergey are up there, that at least for us when we were new, Okay, you get up there and you're so excited to be floating around, but you're a little bit clumsy because you know every little movement sends you sailing, and and I have this image in my mind of, you know, Scott was the the guy who was already aboard, and and Paolo and I would you know want to come over and ask him something, and so we would you know race over there, and it's kind of like, like uh, having a new puppy. You know, that just like crashes through the entire house and things are falling off the walls and Scott is catching things and putting things back on the walls. And then we land at his feet and look up at him like, isn't this great? <laughs> and he's thinking, yeah, great, except I'm picking up after you guys. Here comes Katie. You know, and, well, it, you know, but it happens to everybody. There's a certain sure. amount of time it takes to get used to flying around sure. up there. Yeah. And uh, and so Joe and his crewmates, probably not Gennady. Gennady will just remember how to yeah, just he's, sail this through. This is his fourth time to be yes. there. In and there is a certain memory. And that counts for coming home, too. I'd say it's uh, harder to get used to coming home mm. because you're just used to really gentle movements up in space. And then even walking is a pretty provocative movement. Um, a lot of us are sick. I'll tell you, I was sick when I got home. But there's medicine that can help with that. And, it, I mean, right away, you know, within a couple hours, you know, I felt just fine. But sure, it takes a while to walk a straight line. And as for walking a straight line with your eyes closed, that takes quite a few days. Wow. Well, great. Thank you so much for that. So we have time for one more question. And this is just my question. You um, were the robotics lead and science officer when you were aboard the space station. And I know you um, had many, many different ve vehicles. There were two space shuttles, the uh, uh, three Russian progress supply ships, the ATV-2, that's the automated transfer vehicle. Now it was automated, so you didn't have to worry about that docking. But then there was the Japanese Konotori. And um, you actually had to use the robotics robotic arm to capture and pull that in. And the reason I want to ask about this is because there's some, some similarity with it and the upcoming SpaceX Dragon, that uh, SpaceX Dragon is scheduled to launch um, on Saturday and um, morning at 3.55 in the morning central time. And so can you just tell me real quick what that experience was like using the robotic arm? That was one of the highlights of the entire mission, and, and in fact, I've been, you know, coaching or sharing with the guys who are on board right now about what it was really like, because there's things that just can't simulate, and just having that big supply ship, I mean, it's the size of a school bus, and the Dragon is just a little bit smaller than that, but, um, you know, it comes up, and you see it as just a little speck coming closer and closer and closer, and then it gets really big, and it's like having that big giant bus drive right next to you, and then using the controls of the robotic arm, Paolo and I together, you know, he's calling to and I'm controlling the arm, and, and you reach out and 
grab that thing and you know, my heart was just pounding afterwards. It was just so exciting. But, you know, it's something we practice, and we practice what if this happens, what if this happens. And Don and Joe and uh, Andre have practiced that as well. And they'll be great, but it's just kind of nice to share a little bit about what it's like with them. And even in terms of how we set up the cockpit and, you know, how you can see bright outside and it's dark inside and where to put your procedures and... And, and how big it's really going to look, it's going to be so much fun. And where from in the station are you working when you're doing the robotic arm? So we are in the best place of the station. We're in the cupola doing that. And uh, um, Nicole Stott did the first one, um, HTV1. I did the second one. And we think, as long as Dragon is on time, that uh, Don and Andre and Joe will do the third one. But if it's late, Sunny Williams will be up there. Right. She'll do the grabbing. And we'll, uh, there begins to be a trend. Nicole, Katie, Sunny, we might begin to suspect that only girls can grab supply ships hey, with robotic there you arms. Go. You heard it here. <laughs> Thanks so much. Again, that SpaceX Dragon launch is scheduled to take place on Saturday at 2.55 a.m. Central Time from the Kennedy Space Center. We'll have live coverage for you here on NASA television beginning at 2.30 a.m. Central Time. Katie, thank you so much for coming and uh, out to talk with us. We'll be back here tomorrow for ISS update during the regular time, 10 a.m. Central Time. Up next on NASA TV, a video file at 11 a.m. Central Time. This is Mission Control Houston.